we have no 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 we have finished yesterday uh, with the discussion of influenza there is one little snippet that I wanted to talk to you about remember we we have conversed about the vaccine and how every year people well scientists have to figure out which vaccine to use right we never discussed what makes influenza so mutagenic and there are two factors one factor is called one process is called antigenic drift the influenza genome is RNA does that make sense remember we talked about it's RNA genome now let's forget about viruses for a minute and let's talk about fundamental molecular biology when there is a process of copying DNA and the process of synthesizing RNA during transcription which process do you think is more error-proof DNA synthesis in the cell DNA synthesis or RNA synthesis DNA synthesis why what is the role of DNA what is the major role of DNA in the cell stores what genetic information you don't want any mistakes does that make sense because if there is a mistake this mistake will go on and be transmitted you know be transferred to the further generations in case of RNA if there is a mistake in RNA during transcription, what's going to be the final outcome? Faulty protein. Is that a problem? If there's just one mRNA? Well, I mean, sort of sad, but not that bad. You know, this mRNA will be gone and next one will be fine. Does that make sense? mRNA synthesis is more faulty. It turns out all RNA viruses uh, have pretty high mutagenic rate. They mutate frequently. The RNA in those viruses, when RNA is replicated, there are mutations. Does that make sense? So in, in the influenza virus, with every round of replication, when RNA is copied, there is there are mutations. You see what I'm trying to say here? with every round of replication because RNA is more prone to mutations it makes um, influenza virus change another thing that is called antigenic shift now think about the names drift is something that happens sort of gradually slow shift is something that happens abruptly things shift now I'm, I don't have the, the deck of cards with me but think about this imagine that you have eight cards of different different kinds okay six nine whatnot and say you have eight cards of the same color like all are diamonds right and then you have another eight cards all are hearts to have two stacks of eight cards you put them together you shuffle them and you make two new stacks of eight cards each are those stacks gonna be the same are those stacks gonna be all diamonds and all hearts probably not I mean chances are second to none right so gonna they're gonna be mixed the genome of Influenza is segmented. If you have two viruses of different strains that infect the same human or the same pig, these viruses can shuffle the genetic fragments. 
Does it make sense? It is called reassortment. So one virus can potentially, new virus can acquire three fragments from one parent and five fragments from another. Can you think about that? Can you imagine this process? They shuffling those genomic fragments. It doesn't necessarily mean that the resulting virus will be viable. It may not be. But since we have, there are so many virus particles and so many combinations that some of them may be viable. It was actually shown, remember there was an outbreak of swine flu H1N1 virus in 2009? Uh, about a year later, they demonstrated that genetically that swine flu was the result of reassortment of, I think, one bird strain and one pig strain inside of the pig. So one animal got infected by two viruses simultaneously, they shuffled the genetic genomic fragments and you've got a new virus. And the reason why it spread through the Mexico and then the United States and then caused the global pandemic, which is kind of uh, oxymoron or excessive, you know, caused pandemic. It's a new virus. What does that mean from the standpoint of immunity in the population? It's a new virus. Huh? Exactly. People aren't immune. We were never exposed to anything like that. So we're absolutely naive. And that would warn that it, it spread. That's it. Does that make sense? Let's move to... Huh? Sure. It's antigenic shift, yes. Reassortment causes antigenic shift. It's a mechanism of antigenic shift. Sorry, I... Okay, got it? Now we're getting to uh, an exciting stuff. The deadly virus, Ebola virus. If you've seen the movie Outbreak, which was filmed when I was, I think, four, 1983, with Rene Rousseau and Dustin Hoffman and Kevin Spacey. By the way, Kevin's spoiler alert, Kevin Spacey dies. Um, it's, uh, it's not a bad movie. There are some absolutely outrageously ridiculous things from the standpoint of microbiology, but it's a pretty decent thriller about the infectious outbreak. And definitely they were picturing this outbreak from Ebola. So that's the member of Filoviridae. It's enveloped virus with negative single-strand RNA. It's a zoonotic infection which can affect monkeys and potentially, perhaps, we don't really know, bats. It causes severe hemorrhagic fever. Now, there are data that suggest that Ebola infection in some people can be asymptomatic. So people may not develop any disease whatsoever, be infected but without the disease. What does that mean, severe hemorrhagic fever? We have fever, hemorrhages, which leads to the um, hypovolemic shock usually, organ failure, massive diarrhea, and people die. What you have to understand is that most of that response with hem hemorrhages and organ failures are due not to the virus per se, but to the immune response of your immune response to the virus. It's a BSL-4 pathogen in any country as far as I know. Um, now, how frequent is that? First of all, where are you going to find it? Central Africa, mostly. The recent outbreak was pretty much here, like Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, that western 
Central Africa. This uh, chart shows you the outbreak by here. And you can see, you know, there was larger outbreaks like in 1976, smaller ones like in 2004. And you can see that mortality, so uh, blue column is number of people who survived and red is number of people that died. You can see that mortality changes. And interestingly enough, smaller outbreaks for some reason have higher case fatality ratio. Maybe because we just don't have enough people to collect representative statistics. How reliable are those data? They aren't. Think about Africa. You have a little village. 10, 15 people live somewhere in the savanna or close to the woods. You know, they hunt, they do some agriculture. And one of them kills the monkey and skins it and acquires Ebola and he dies and 90% of the village dies. Does anyone know? Not really, no. You see, they're far from hospitals. They don't go to the hospital. They may not even have time or money, resources to do that. So the number of cases is probably underestimated. How is that transmitted? Bodily fluids, which means sweat, urine, saliva, mucus. There's no transmission by respiratory aerosol. As I brought it up on several occasions, you are not going to get Ebola by talking to someone with Ebola. Okay. Um, sexual transmission is implicated. And there were cases that showed, you know, there's a person with no clinical Ebola disease, Ebola virus disease, who had Ebola virus in the semen, isolated in the semen, and that same person transmitted Ebola virus to a couple of women that he had sex with. Okay. It is all points at the sexual transmission. But if it is present, it must be extremely rare. Because you can imagine, if it would be the major route of transmission, we would see the epidemic of completely different proportions. Okay. There's no vector-borne transmission, no mosquitoes, nothing like that. Um, can we vaccinate against Ebola? We can. The vaccine is experimental. Obviously, FDA doesn't really care because it's not in the United States, so who cares about approving vaccine that's not going to be used in the U.S. soil? WHO may, and WHO is interested in um, Ebola vaccine. Unfortunately, the vaccine was rolled out at the end of epidemic. There were not enough cases to properly address the efficacy of vaccine. Data that were obtained showed that it was effective. Of course, the idea is not to vaccinate the entire population of Africa, but to use it for ring vaccinations. If the Ebola patient is identified, then all his contacts, the relatives, the co-workers, the friends, they all um, get vaccinated. Drugs, there are a couple of antivirals that are available. Again, the efficacy is under the question. I'm not saying that they're bad, absolutely not. But here's the problem. When people got sick, and we kind of, I'm going to go back to antivirals. So when people got sick in Africa, they came for treatment to the local hospitals. That's pictures of local hospital and what the streets of some African cities in the poor countries look like. So it's extreme poverty. It's dysfunctional government. It's the lack of proper public health and infrastructure. Therefore, hospitals often didn't have the personal protective equipment. I'm not talking about Tyvek suits. I'm talking about gloves. No IV lines. 
So treatment was not available. That's why mortality rate was extremely high. Another reason, of course, is, you know, the local customs that facilitated transmission, let's put it this way. Uh, in addition to that, something that points out that Ebola is not as deadly as we presented, when two American doctors were flown to Emory University Medical Center, to BSL-4 hospital facility, to get the treatment, we had no drugs against Ebola specific. We had no vaccine, nothing. They were placed on the IV line, replenishing fluids, pretty much supportive care. Yes, they were given antivirals, and they received antibodies isolated from a serum of a boy, an African boy, that survived a bowl infection. Now, how efficient those treatments were, we don't know. Because we cannot separate the specific treatments from the high level of normal hospital care that they received. And data, unpublished data, but sort of observational data from doctors, like uh, Doctors Without Borders organizations and whatnot, they show that if Ebola patients are placed in the conditions with the normal hospital care, with IV lines available, proper nutrition, um, proper like anti-inflammatory drugs, the mortality rate is as low as 10%. It's still high, don't get me wrong. Seriously. So if in this class we would have Ebola, 2.8 people would die. Okay, but... Uh, it's much lower than 90%, right? Um, so essentially, it's the social disease, economical disease, rather than uh, 21st century plague. Um, can Ebola virus become epidemic in the United States? The answer is, what do you think? What do you think? What is the answer? Can Ebola virus become epidemic in the United States? Can we have Ebola epidemic? Like, I, f I have like a guy, bring the guy Ebola with Ebola to, I don't know, Cleveland, Ohio. Is there a chance we're going to have like a plague that will kill 50% of Americans? Absolutely not. Yes, you're absolutely correct. There's no way. We don't get in touch with each other too often. When people die, we tend to put them into the coffins and close them right away. So we don't kiss them too much. Okay? And we don't have like 150 people that attend and kiss the, the dead person. We have great level of hospital care. We have great public health system. So all those people will be isolated and placed in the proper you know, uh, containment and treat it, okay? Some of them will probably die, but it's not good. Think about this. How many cases, let's count how many cases we had. So we had two doctors flown to Emory. They both survived. We had Liberian guy, well, his American citizen was, uh, who came back from Liberia, did not tell that he had a contact with a Ebola patient while in Liberia, was hospitalized with progressed advanced disease, died in Dallas. We had two nurses that acquired the disease from that Liberian guy. One of those nurses flew from Dallas to Cleveland and back, did not infect a single person on those two planes, and did not infect anyone while in Cleveland. Second nurse didn't infect anyone either. We had um, the doctor from Guinea. I'm not sure which country. He also was American citizen. He was helping out. And he contracted the disease and he was flown to University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, but it was too late. He was just too sick. So he died in Omaha. And we had two deaths. And we had a doctor from New York who came from Africa. That was, that was so outrageously funny for me. Even on Daily Show, they made fun of it. So he flew from Africa 
already sick. Next day, he went like on a bike ride, then he went bowling with his friends, and then he went to a local bar. And next day he felt sick and was hospitalized. So that was John Stewart, and he said, I want to be infected with Ebola too, go in bowling and you know, with go to drink with my friends and whatnot. He no infections whatsoever. While he was drinking and bowling and everything. It's not easily transmitted. So we had several people who were infected, but only what? Two cases of transmission on the US soil, those two nurses. It's not possible. Um, however, there was an outbreak of Ebola virus, the Reston strain, in the monkey colony in Reston, Virginia. Um, the, the, there's a book about it, The Hot Zone. Um, this info about Ridley Scott, that Ridley Scott plans to make a movie, it's probably an outdated info now. I didn't check in the last year. Maybe he still plans it. I don't know. Um, so what happened, there were sick monkeys and personnel of that monkey facility turned out to have antibodies. Nobody had any sign of disease. Um, now, the last question, how important Ebola is in Africa? The answer is, with all due respect, and you know, if the statement starts with the words with all due respect, there's going to be something bad about the, the topic of discussion. Look at the table. HIV and AIDS kill how many? One, one million people in 2012. Low respiratory infections, by the way, low respiratory infections. What should you read behind the line? Tuberculosis kills another million. Diarrhea kills more than half a million. Meningitis, meningitis that is vaccine preventable, meningococcal, pneumococcal, or hemophilus influenza, kills quarter million people in a year, which is eight times more than Ebola infected in the entire epidemic, and 16 times more than the number of people that died. So by any means, it is not an important cause of mortality in Africa. Currently, there is a famine going in Nigeria. The richest country in Africa has a famine. I still, I'm still processing that information. The, Nigeria has shitload of oil. It's one of the richest oil, like oil richest countries. There are five million people that starve. So when we talk about, we, when we talk about Africa, it's a government. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's infrastructure lack of it. Okay. So you have to think, I want you to start thinking about the diseases, not only like the disease, but also think about this maybe social implications or social causes of the disease. Okay. My love, flavies, flaviviruses. They positive strand RNA viruses. The, remember I showed you the video of the virus replication? It was dengue, that was flavivirus. Um, they enveloped, not really stable, um, small, about 50 nanometers in diameter. There are a few notable viruses that you've heard about. West Nile, I bet you've heard. Dengue, uh, yellow fever. You may have not heard about Japanese encephalitis, pretty common in China, Japan, Far Eastern Russia. Tick-borne encephalitis, which can be found practically in all Western Europe um, and Asian part of Russia. And I'm going to talk about just a few diseases. So, uh, yellow fever. That's the reason why flaviviruses are called flavi. Flavi means yellow in Greek. 
So it's a biphasic, bi, all flavivirus diseases are biphasic. What does that mean? It means that first, if you develop the disease, because if you are bitten with a mosquito that carries yellow fever, you're not necessarily going to develop the disease. First phase is called flu-like. Some people compare a flu itself as being hit by a train. My former boss had a conversation with, I probably told you the American military a member, who had dengue. He said if he could reach the gun, he would kill himself. It was so bad. That was first phase. It's high fever, myalgia, nausea, uh, can be vomiting, uh, muscle aches, joint aches, especially in case of dengue. Okay. And then, sometimes the second phase occurs. Yellow fever is a hemorrhagic disease with specifically uh, hepatic symptoms, so people develop jaundice. Um, mortality is pretty high for second phase yellow fever. If it's untreated, it's up to 30% mortality. But we have a vaccine. It's a very effective vaccine. It's a live attenuated 17D vaccine, um, which I strongly suggest you get if you go to South America or Africa or Southeast Asia. You don't need to, to take it if you go to Europe. Other than that, get it. No side effects. I've got vaccinated. Pretty much the entire lab got vaccinated. Perfect. Just nothing. Um, dengue. To give you numbers, two and a half billion people. That shows you the distribution of yellow fever. Dengue, I can show you distribution like this. That's dengue. Okay? Two and a half billion people are at risk. 500,000 cases of dengue fever annually, first phase. 50,000 cases of dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome. Um, I believe about 15,000 deaths. Doesn't sound like a lot, but again, think about social implications. Those are poor countries, and when people are infected with dengue fever, it cannot work. Okay? There is a vaccine against dengue, which is in trial, but there are some complications about this molecular complications. Uh, there is actually a vaccine that doesn't prevent the infection, but decreases or prevents dengue hemorrhagic fever, the hemorrhagic manifestations in children. So it reduces mortality in children significantly. Both diseases, dengue and yellow fever, are transmitted by Aedes aegypti mosquito. They can be urban, so both dengue and yellow fever can be transmitted from human to human by a mosquito. Does that make sense? Mosquito can bite, bite one person and transmit the infection to another. There is also a so-called sylvatic cycle. When mosquito transmits through the humans or monkeys in Africa. And jungle cycle, also monkeys. So monkeys... Uh, monkeys and humans are reservoirs and hosts for infection. And one of the reasons why um, sorry it's brain freeze. One of the reasons why yellow fever and dengue spiked in the recent years is deforestation. People get into the forests and expose themselves to mosquitoes, essentially. Okay. Uh, West Nile, same biphasic disease. First phase is pretty similar to all flaviviruses. However, second phase in West Nile is encephalitic. Encephalitis develops in um, adults and in children uh, who are at, who has Worse symptoms, adults or children? Worse symptoms. I'm not saying who's more 
susceptible to infection, but once the person develops encephalitis, who suffers more, adults or children? Adults, why? Solid cranium, yes. In kids, cranium is kind of soft, so there's a place for expansion. Okay, adults are at higher risk of the damaging brain swelling. Um, there is a vaccine for horses, for I think for dogs now. Uh, human vaccine is in trials and it looks very promising. Now this disease is transmitted by the mosquitoes called Culex pipiens. It's just different genera. These mosquitoes are present in the United States. Um, so there were about 2 million cases of West Nile in the U.S. that are confirmed by serology. So we know that about 2 million people were infected with West Nile. The number of cases every year, it's like 2 in Texas, so it is not deadly. Does that make sense? It's not really deadly disease. The um, chances to develop the full-blown encephalitis are very low. Okay. People are scared, but to be honest, it's not as bad as being hit by a car. I think there are more chances to get an accident. So understand the biphasic concept, mosquito transmission is biological vector, okay, and one thing like of, of note, if mosquito is present, there's going to be transmission, if mosquito is not present, there's not going to be transmission, and we talked about it, West Nile, oh, and for West Nile, think about this, for yellow fever and dengue, the reservoir and the host are monkeys and humans. Either of those species, are they present in the United States? Well, humans are. No monkeys, right? As far as I know, I mean, wild monkeys. There are no wild monkeys in the U.S. West Nile, the reservoir of birds. West Nile was not on the U.S. soil till 1999 when it entered, and we know this city, it was New York. It arrived in New York in 1999 and spread through the population of U.S. birds, and it infects everything. So now it is anzootic in the, U in the birds in the U.S. You can find it in pretty much any bird, right? So it can maintain itself outside of the human population. It is not transmitted from human to human by mosquitoes, but it spills over into humans from birds. Does that make sense? So for West Nile, there is no human to human transmission. It's entirely zoonotic, only from birds. Oh, shameless plug. If you Google Lakeland Community College in my last name on the YouTube, there is an hour long presentation on Zika virus. Not that I'm encouraging you to watch it. Um, it was more, I did it to kind of calm people down because everybody, well, a lot of people were freaking out about Zika. So it's another Flavia virus. It was discovered at 47. Yeah, there's a go. 47. That's the genome of a typical um, Flavia virus. That's the electron microscopy of. Zika, so you have four structural and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven non structural proteins. Yes, um, so virus was isolated in monkeys, later, was shown to cause neurological disease in mice, and nothing remarkable. Okay, then first human cases were identified in Africa and nobody cared. Then in 2007, there was an outbreak in the Southeast, in Southeast Asia. It's uh, French Polynesia, Indonesia, New Caledonia here. 
So there was there were few outbreaks actually. Okay. Now to give you an idea how mild the disease is, this outbreak was found retrospectively. Scientists checked the serum of like archive serum archival samples and found antibodies to Zika. So nobody complained, but there was an infection. And then virus 2013-14 migrated to South America and then when it is all began. The infection itself well let's talk about transmission for a second. Again, Edis aegypti, bless you, that's where Edis aegypti is present. And if you'll go back and look at the geographical distribution of the virus, you can see that it's obvious. It just, just matches so well. The presence of Edis aegypti mosquitoes and geographical distribution of Zika virus. Does that make sense? There's not going to be Zika virus in Ohio because we have winter. Mosquitoes don't winter well. Period. That's it. Okay, we have new populations each year, but they have to climb up. There will be no outbreak of Zika. The autochthonous outbreak. People can come from, I don't know, vacation in Mexico, but other than that, no. So, another species of mosquito that may transmit Zika is Edis albopictus. It can be present in Ohio, but we don't really know if it will transmit. We don't have any reliable data yet on the transmission by these mosquitoes. Symptoms. In adults and kids, doesn't really matter. The symptoms are pretty in healthy person, the symptoms are rash, fever, joint pain, retroorbital pain, muscle pain. Doesn't sound very exciting, but something that can be tolerated. It sounds like a flu-like illness. Okay. Very similar to infections with viruses like dengue or chikungunya. The diagnosis is via PCR, polymerase chain reaction, or um, the assay for antibodies in the serum can be used. However, the problem with antibody assay, Zika and Dengue turn out to be very, very close. So there is a lot of cross-reactivity. People who were definitely infected with Zika can show up as Dengue positive and vice versa. People who were infected with dengue can show up as Zika positive. Same goes for yellow fever. Okay, there's a lot of cross reactivity, which makes the diagnosis problematic. And then the health officials in Brazil started to notice a scary pattern that they observed much more cases of microcephaly in newborns when Zika epidemic started in Brazil. And of course, you know, the question was, why, why is that so? What is microcephaly, first of all? Exactly. Abnormally, abnormally small hand. There are strict criteria for microcephaly. You have to appreciate that kids are born with differently sized heads, okay? So there is a criteria. If the head is three standard deviations smaller than the average, it's microcephaly. If it's five standard deviations smaller, it's severe microcephaly. So there are clinical criteria. Now, here's the great example of epidemiology and how hard it is. What you have, you have an epidemic of Zika virus. And you have a lot of babies that have microcephaly. 
Not that you need to link those two, but you have to investigate whether those two are connected. In ideal case, we take a group of pregnant women, separate them in a control and experimental and infect experimental group with Zika virus, and see if they're going to give birth to microcephalic babies. Obviously, it's not possible. So you have to work with pregnant women that are there. You have to test them for Zika virus, and then you have to correlate Zika virus infection that happened during pregnancy with the microcephaly. Of course, to complicate things, it turns out that some women gave birth to microcephalic babies without any history of Zika virus infection, and some women who were infected with Zika gave birth to absolutely healthy babies. So it's not 100%, but there is correlation, there was correlation, okay, that more microcephalic cases were observed, you know, after the birth in women who were infected with Zika. Eventually, the mouse model of disease was developed, and in mouse model, it was shown that infection of pregnant mice leads to the brain abnormalities in the fetus and localization of the virus in the fetal brain and intrauterine growth retardation and those abnormalities were similar to the ones we observed in human cases of microcephaly. Then there was a study in Slovenia as far as I remember when they had a woman who returned from South America. She was pregnant, she had Zika virus and I think she had stillbirth and the fetus was microcephalic, so they did autopsy. Very, very extensive and detailed study. And they found virus in the brain, they found all the pathologies, they, they did really like excruciatingly complete study of the fetus. And they, it was N of 1, but it was really good study. So eventually, there are criteria, so-called Shepherds and Bradford Hill criteria. They determine if some agent is teratogenic, i.e. causes abnormalities in the fetus. So eventually all the data that we have, it turns out they um, satisfied both Shepherds and Bradford Hill criteria and we now say that Zika virus in some cases, you have to remember that it's not 100%, but in some cases, causes um, microcephaly. Now, it's all very interesting. It's all very exciting. What's going on now in South America? Do they still have Zika virus? Sure enough. Do they have an epidemic? It's going down. And the reason for that? People who are infected, they don't die. They survive. They are immune. So essentially, at some point, the majority of population will become immune, and there will be no transmission. Does that make sense? So it's sort of self-inflicted immunization against Zika. Okay? Now, should you travel to Mexico, if you have a chance, what do you think? I will be an arrogant asshole and say, I'm a man, I don't care. Seriously. There were some cases of sexual transmission, though. But other than that, I mean, why do I care? Well, females, if you are not planning to become pregnant, if you are not pregnant, then you're good to go. If you're pregnant, you may reconsider. If you planning on doing that, again, depends. it all depends on where you go. If you go to like wild, hot, in the middle of a jungle, then it may not be a great idea right now, even right now. If you go to a local resort, mosquitoes are not really present on the beaches. They blow it away by the breeze. I'm dead serious. Okay. 
it's not very many of them. So very low chances of transmission, extremely low chances of transmission. Okay. If you go into like swampy areas, that's a different story. Does that make sense? There will be no vaccine. I don't believe in it. I mean, some companies, some some scientists rolled out the vaccine, but nobody nobody cares by now. It's all pretty much gone away. There was Zika in Miami, uh, about twenty eight cases. Um, I think it's fair. You know, if you live in such a nice city as Miami, you have to be punished somehow. Um, another syndrome associated with Zika is Guillain Barre syndrome, which we discussed. Um, we don't know why, probably because some proteins of um, Zika viruses similar with some human proteins. It was shown that they have certain structural similarities. Okay. Um, yeah, no vaccine, no treatment. It's just faded out. Spread in the U.S. This is pretty cool because this map rolled out by University of Minnesota was shown before the actual cases in Miami happened. Uh, so the color, the red is the high abundance of Aedes aegypti mosquito. The size of the circle is the number of people that come from Zika endemic areas. So you can see Miami and Orlando combined are the highest risk. Cleveland is not even on the map. There's practically no risk. Probably because very little people fly in and from those affected countries and there are no mosquitoes. There's no it is Egypti and the quantity is large enough. Does that make sense? For uh, before we move on, uh, I first of all I have posted the study guides. You may have seen them. Um, well, we'll try to do some review, maybe not during the class, but kind of put it online for you, so you know what to focus on. Why there is no transmission of mosquito-borne diseases in the United States? Extensive transmission. We talked about. It. Mm -hmm. We don't go outside. No exposure to mosquitoes. There is no transmission. Does that make sense? For these viruses, for at least for Flavies, for all viruses, transmission, whether we have vaccine or not. And I have some specific questions that address things like biphasic disease, um, what is hemorrhagic fever, hemorrhages and fever. Um, it's all in the study guide. You will all see that. Okay. Now we can take a break. When we will return, we will start.